Hi guys, it is a wind blasted day here in the collapsing party town of South Austin, Texas as we wind down South by Southwest 2014. Talk about a collapse as the, as the wet hippies roll up their tents. This is your old doomsday preacher ham bone sitting in doomsday trailer getting ready to head out and party one more day but before i do let me bring you this is actually going to be part two of my three week sermon apparently as i share with you on sunday march 16 2014 today's second doomsday sermon from my fellow doomsday prophet Jared Diamond in his 2005 classic Peak into the End Times Collapse. There you go. In one word, collapse. How societies choose to fail or succeed. And this is uh, him detailing uh, the ways we are choosing to fail, not just here in the United States, but globally, how we're choosing to fail. And I thought that I could get today's sermon but, uh, into a half hour, but good God, guys, I, I could just sit here and read this book. If, if, if you read one book this year, and this is not for pussies, this book. If you really want to figure out what is going on on this planet and why there's no hope for it, and then pick up this book. We're gonna dive in. We're gonna we're gonna review chapters 14 and 15 out of this 16 chapter book. Then I'm gonna come back at you next week with one last uh, sermon from the last chapter. But leading up to the last chapter, let's uh, we're in part four now. Practical lessons. Uh, where he looks, we've gone from the past to the future. Now this is Jared Diamond looking ahead nine years ago into uh, the collapse of global industrial civilization unfolding in the 21st century. And this is some of the points my fellow Doomsday Prophet has come up with, which I am going to share with you now. Take it away, Jared. What I am going to propose is a road map of factors contributing to failures of group decision making. They, there's these failures uh, in our decision making that is going to bring down this civilization and probably this uh, planet. I'll divide the factors into a fuzzily delineated sequence of four categories. First, first of all, a group may fail to anticipate a problem before the problem actually arises. Second, when the problem does arrive, the group may fail to perceive it. Then after they perceive it, they may, they may fail even to try to solve it. Finally, they may try to solve it, but may not succeed. There you go. Uh, that is some different ways. Okay, perhaps the commonest circumstance under which societies fail to perceive a problem is when it takes the form of a slow trend concealed by wide up and down fluctuations. The prime example in modern times is global warming. Politicians use the term creeping normalcy. I love that term creeping normalcy to refer to such slow trends concealed within noisy fluctuations. If the economy, schools, 
traffic congestion, or anything else is deteriorating only slowly, it is difficult to recognize that each successive year is on the average slightly worse than the year before. So one's baseline standard for what constitutes normalcy shifts gradually and imperceptibly. It may take a few decades of a long sequence of such slight year-to-year -year changes before people realize with a jolt that conditions used to be much better several decades ago and that what is accepted as normalcy today has crept downwards. This is what happened to me in 2008 with the five grams of mushrooms. I realized with a jolt that conditions used to be much better several decades ago. Okay, the third stop on the road map to failure, the road map to failure is the most frequent, the most surprising, and requires the mo requires the longest discussion because it assumes a wide variety of forms. Contrary to what Joseph Tainter in his famous book on collapsing societies, Contrary to what Tainter and almost anyone else would have expected, it turns out that societies do often fail even to attempt to solve a problem once it has been perceived. Many of the reasons for such failure fall under the heading of what economists term rational behavior arising from clashes of interest between people. That is, some people may reason correctly that they can advance their own interest by behavior harmful to other people. Scientists term such behavior, quote, rational precisely because it does employ correct reasoning even though it may be morally reprehensible. The perpetrators know damn well, well I put the word in anyway, it, know that they will often get away with their bad behavior, especially if there is no law against it or if the law is not effectively enforced. They feel safe because the perpetrators are typically concentrated to a few in number and highly motivated by the prospect of reaping big, certain, and immediate profits while the losses are spread over large numbers of individuals. That gives the losers little motivation to go to the hassle of fighting back because each loser only loses a little bit and would receive only small, uncertain, distant profits even from successfully undoing the minority's grab. Examples include so-called perverse subsidies, talking about how we subsidize fossil fuel industries, overfishing, sugar growing, cotton growing, blah, blah, blah. And the losers in all of this, meaning all the taxpayers, are less vocal than the, than the big the corporate uh, giants getting this corporate welfare. Uh, we are less vocal because the subsidy is funded by just a small amount of money concealed in each citizen's tax bill. <clears throat> measures benefiting a small minority at the expense 
of a large majority are especially likely to arise in certain types of democracies that bestow swing power on some small group such as senators from small states in the U.S. Senate. Can you say grazing on public lands and wolf killing where a few senators representing a tiny minority of citizens are, are, are getting away with shit that if it was put to a vote to all of Americans, we would shut it down. One particular form of clashes of interest has become well known under the name Tragedy of the Commons in turn closely related to the conflicts termed, quote, the prisoner's dilemma and the logic of collective action. Consider a situation in which many consumers are harvesting a, commu a communally owned resource, such as fishermen catching fish in an area of ocean or herders grazing their sheep on a communal pasture. If everybody over harvests the resources, it will become depleted by overfishing or, or overgrazing and thus decline or even disappear, and all of the consumers will suffer. It would therefore be in the common interest of all consumers to exercise restraint and not overharvest. But as long as there is no effective regulation of how much resource each consumer can harvest, then each consumer would be correct to reason, if I don't catch that fish or let my sheep graze that grass, some other fisherman or herder will anyway, so it makes no sense for me to refrain from overfishing or overharvesting. That correct rational behavior is then to harvest before the next person can, even though the result may be the destruction of the commons and then and thus harm for all consumers. Now, guys, this isn't rocket sciences. Clashes of interest involving rational behavior are also prone to arise when the principal consumer has no long-term stake in preserving the resource but society as a whole does. For example, much commercial harvesting of tropical rainforests today is carried out by international logging companies, which typically take out short-term leases on land in one country, cut down the rainforest on all their leased land in that country, and then move on to the next country. The loggers have correctly perceived that once they have paid for their lease, their interests are best served by cutting down the forest as quickly as possible, reneging on any agreement to replant, and leaving. In that way, loggers have destroyed most of the lowland forests of the Malaysian Peninsula, then of Borneo, then of the Solomon Islands, then of Sumatra, now of the Philippines, moving into New Guinea, the Amazon jungle, and eventually the Congo Basin in Africa. Do you see how this works, guys? It is the planet-eating two-step, I call it. A further conflict of interest involving rational behavior arises when the interest of the decision-making elite in power clash with the interest, meaning the survival interest, of the rest of the society. 
especially if the elite can insulate themselves from the consequences of their actions. Can you say gated communities? Can you say underground cities? they are likely to continue to do things that profit themselves regardless of whether their actions hurt everybody else. And we're talking everybody else on the entire planet. Such classes flagrantly personified by these, uh, anyway, goes into some of those, are becoming increasingly frequent in the modern U.S. where rich people tend to live within their gated compounds and to drink bottled water. Throughout recorded history, actions or inactions by self-absorbed kings, chiefs, and politicians have been a regular cause of societal collapses, including those of the Maya kings, the Greenland Norse chiefs, and modern Rwandan politicians already discussed in this book. I talked about those in rant uh, number one last week. It appears to me that much of the rigid opposition to environmental concerns in the first day, in the first world nowadays involves values acquired early in life and never again re-examined. The maintenance intact by rulers and policy makers of the ideas they started with to quote Barbara Tuchman, I'm not sure who that is, it is painfully difficult to decide whether to abandon some of one's core values when they seem to be becoming incompa incompatible with survival. Can we say, giving up that gas-sucking car? But at what point do we as individuals prefer to die than to compromise and live? Millions of people in modern times have indeed faced the decision whether to save their own life they would be willing to betray their friends or relatives acquiesce in a vile dictatorship, live as virtual slaves, or flee their countries. Now, nations and societies have to make similar decisions collectively. Perhaps a crux of success or failure as a society is to know which core values to hold on to and which ones to discard and replace with new values when times change. All right, diving in deeper to now we're going to irrational motives. <clears throat> Common irrational motives for failure to address problems include that the public may widely dislike those doomsday prophets. He didn't say that, I did. The public may widely dislike those who first perceive and complain about the problem. Can you say murder the messenger? Uh, good Lord. Don't need to go into that rant. The final speculative, re well he had plenty more, I'm just jumping ahead to the final uh, reason that I shall mention for irrational failure to try to solve a perceived problem is psychological denial. This is a technical term with a precisely defined meaning in 
individual psychology that has been taken over into the pop, pop culture. If something that you perceive arouses in you a painful emotion, such as a collapse of a planet, you may subconsciously suppress or deny your perception of the problem in order to avoid the unbearable pain, even though the practical results of ignoring your perceptions may prove ultimately disastrous. And we're talking for yourself, for your children, for your grandchildren, for humanity, and for a planet. Finally, even after a society has anticipated, perceived, or tried to solve a problem, it may still fail for obvious possible other reasons. The problem may be beyond our present capacities to solve, can you say Fukushima and climate change. A solution may exist, but be prohibitively expensive, can you say getting rid of fossil fuels, and our efforts may be too little and too late, can you say climate change. Some attempted solutions backfire and make the problem worse, such as oh, the cane toad's introduction into a Australia to control insect pests, or forest fire suppression in the American West, and many past societies lacked the detailed ecological knowledge that now permits us to cope better with the problems in their, uh, than that those that they faced, if we will uh, put that into action. And other problems continue to resist solution today, meaning into the uh, 21st century. And now I'm going to dive in to Big Business and the Environment, Chapter 15. We're going to read from here, and then I'll just have to make a whole different rant, I guess, uh, for chapter, the last chapter, Chapter 16. But let me jump way ahead in here. And this is, he goes through all of these and, uh, you know, the, the big environment, the big business, the global corporatocracy taking down this planet, and he just goes down the list. This is him talking about logging in particular, but this can, uh, what's good for logging is good for so much of planet eating. Okay, with logging companies, as with the mining companies that we just discussed, we have to ask ourselves why they behave in a way that is morally reprehensible. The answer, again, is that their morally reprehensible behavior is profitable to them because of the same three factors motivating the mining companies. Economics, the industry's corporate culture, and the attitudes of society and government. Tropical hardwood logs are so valuable and in demand by the public that rape and run logging of least tropical forest land is immensely profitable. Acquiescence of the local people can be obtained because the local people are desperate for cash and have never seen the disastrous consequences that clear-cutting tropical rainforest brings to them. Officials in the government forestry departments uh, can be bribed 
lack the international perspective and financial resources of the logging companies and may not realize the high value of finished timber. Under those circumstances, Rape and Run will continue to be good business until the companies start to run out of unlogged countries. And, and, and guys, you know what he's saying here, it's logging, it's seafood, it's mining, it's oil drilling, it is planet eating. And who is to blame? It is at the bottom, it is the consumers of the products, which is what he ends this chapter with. Oh... Uh, uh, adding to the timber company's concerns about their social license and credibility, now we're, you know, as we we're just saying, is the impending extinction of the forest they have the log, to which is the basis of their business. You know? Uh, anyway, guys, I, I, I think you get his point. Uh, uh, about these planet-eating sons of bitches. Good God. And uh, jumping ahead to the to the last section, it would take what he does an oversimplification, guys, of this. Since I'm not going to sit here and just read this, it would take me 20 minutes. He is basically ending up. Although I'm going to this this is me talking, not him. He's going back to Atlas Shrugged. If you want to put these sons of bitches out of business, there's one way to do it: is to stop buying their products. You you can do all of this. Uh, all of this bitching and moaning about those blue meanie planet eaters eating this planet, taking down this civilization, taking down this planet, but as long as you're buying the products, all of your bitching and moaning, they're laughing all the way to the bank. This is simply Jared Diamond. Uh, this is his rant, trying to knock some damn sense into you that uh, the planet eaters would not be in business if we were not buying their products. Anyway, uh, I'll read some of this. Uh, in brief, wrapping up big business in the environment. In brief, environmental practices of big businesses are shaped by a fundamental fact that for many of us offends our sense of justice. Depending on the circumstances, a business really may maximize its profits, at least in the short term, by damaging the environment and hurting people. That is still the case today for fishermen in an unmanaged fishery without quotas, for international logging companies with short-term leases on tropical rainforest, and, and countries with corrupt officials, uh, on the case with oil companies, blah, blah, blah. Now, moving ahead, it is easy and cheap for the rest of us to blame business, these businesses, for helping itself by hurting other people. But that blaming alone is unlikely to produce change. It ignores the fact that businesses are not nonprofit charities, but profit making companies, and that publicly owned companies with shareholders are under obligation to those shareholders to maximize corporate profits. I, I talked about this, I believe. Two weeks ago in my rant, this was my rant, the corporation, the pathological pursuit of profit and power. 
we are not going to shut down these sons of bitches by getting on here and YouTube and ranting about them, putting a goddamn uh, bumper sticker on our gas-sucking car and going off to a Keystone pipeline meeting in our gas-sucking car with our little bumper Save the Planet bumper sticker. Our blaming of businesses ignores the ultimate responsibility of the public for creating the conditions that let businesses profit through hurting the public. There you go. Uh, then he goes and, 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 and goes through how many examples does this man need to catalog. And he's not looking back 5,000 years, guys, in, in this paragraph that would take me 20 minutes to read. He, he is saying, this is the shit that is unfolding. He's got, let's see, we have uh, Exxon, we've got uh, Home Depot, we've got Chevron, we've got the FDNA, and uh, we've got Tiffany's Jewelers, and let's don't forget McDonald's Corporation. Jesus Christ, and then moving down, uh, close, nearing the bottom of this chapter, some readers may be disappointed or outraged that I place the ultimate responsibility for business practices harming the public on the public itself. Uh, there, uh, th 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 there you go. Uh, <laughs> my views may seem uh, to ignore a moral imperative that businesses should just follow virtuous principles whether or not it is profitable for them to do so. I instead prefer to recognize that throughout human history, in all politically complex human societies in which people encounter other individuals with whom they have no ties of family or clan relationship, government regulation has arisen precisely because it was found to be necessary for the enforcement of moral principles. Invocation of moral principles is a necessary first step for eliciting virtuous behavior, but even that alone is not a sufficient step. There you go. And then, of course, he goes off course on his, on his final uh, paragraph. To me, the conclusion that the public has the ultimate responsibility for the behavior of even the biggest corporations is empowering and hopeful rather than disappointing. Uh, yeah, because here he is in 2005, uh, he, he, yeah, looking at uh, his hope that the, the public, meaning the consuming public, is going to pull their head out of their ass and look in the goddamn mirror, mirror and understand who is bringing down this planet. It is not Exxon, it is not Chevron, it is not Dow Chemical, Monsanto, uh, or Home Depot, or McDonald's Corporation. It is each and every one of us buying these morally reprehensible sons of bitches products. And with that, I'm, uh, I'm getting hungry. I got to get on my gas-sucking bicycle, get out there and party while the planet burns, and I probably have to stop by McDonald's 
corporation for my $1 factory farmed McChicken sandwich on my way out of here to party while this planet burns. So I will save the final chapter, the final chapter on uh, Jared Diamond's Bible of the Apocalypse Collapse. I guess I will get a third sermon out of this for Sunday, March 16th, 2014. This is your Doomsday Prophet, Hammond Littledale, your Doomsday Preacher, wrapping up his sermon to get out there and party for five days straight while the planet collapses all around me. Bye, guys.